So I'm Chad Bryson, this is Corey Allen, mm. and we work for In the Spread Freshwater. And today we're going to do a muskie seminar because hopefully you guys are either already muskie fishing, interested in muskie fishing, or didn't have anything else to do today except come and listen to both of us give our opinions about a whole lot of things. Um, so we're going to try and cover everything as simply as possible, and hopefully you walk away today with a lot of really cool free gear and a lot of good information. Um, neither of us hide any secrets in regards to how we fish, where we fish, what we do, or any of that. Because at the end of the day, the truth is, is that it's not that technical and not that complicated. It just seems like it is. Um, so that's what we're hoping to do. Well, I don't know. Like the biggest thing for me is like, if you're always looking for that kind of stuff, you're always going to be following someone else. Like. Then there was a guy named Buck Perry I said a lot from, and uh, he would always say that, like, you know, uh, every time you'd be following the bite, you know, it's like, well, you should have been here yesterday. Like, that's the story. Like, it's the people, you, wanna, you don't want to be the guys that are following everybody. You want to be the guy everybody follows. And so that's the way you have to look at stuff. Like, too many times I see people and they're like, and they look at you and they think you're, like, full of shit. You know, it's like you'll say something and you'll be like, and you try to do that disclaimer where it's like, this is not absolute because none of it's absolute like never they've never seen anything absolute there's no one way to completely do it the same way every single time yeah people are always so, looking yeah they're looking for like the color yep or the size or all this stuff yeah what's the best fly you use i don't know all of them yeah exactly so, so yeah like you learn how to think for yourself type thing like don't just look for those little like people are looking for the bullet points and the notes like they'll go out there and they'll just religiously do that over and over and over again like more than anything, we want to teach you how to think out there for yourself. So, like, that's, that's the best thing I think I can do, we can do. So one thing I want to do, I want to thank everybody for being here today. And I want to thank everybody that, uh, all the sponsors and everybody that made it happen. Gary Merriman, with, that owns the Fish Hawk, provided us this, uh, which was really super nice. And we appreciate it, Gary, a whole lot. Can't repay you enough. A um, lot of the fly fishing manufacturers chipped in donated some stuff for giveaways reddington scientific anglers umqua hardy uh who else regal vices donated a light um i think that's about it on my end looks like rs nets <coughs> roman donated a super nice musky net like the nicest net i've ever seen um, the nicest one that exists to be yeah. Nice. yeah so and i don't i don't know what Corey's people brought in but we need to acknowledge them. No, it's cool. Uh, Eastfield Lures, uh, which is actually a Swedish company. And uh, these are literally the first ones that have ever been in North America. Well, the United States, one guy in Canada. That's pretty cool. We got some of those up for grabs. Um, new little jerk bait called the Berkeley Juke. There's like a great little wintertime, springtime, early transition suspending crankbait. Like we'll talk about that. Like don't go into this thinking that everything you got to throw has got to be like, you know, XL. And then uh, on that note, like I also got some baits that are a little bit out of season right now, but coming really handy next summer. Uh, Megafrox, which is actually a beta uh, company out of Thailand, and they make snakehead baits, uh, which actually cross over really well for muskie. And uh, we won't go into a whole lot of that today, like in detail, but we will talk about like how to analyze baits from different industries per se, and recognize their value for uh, muskie fishing, or vice versa. Like just how to kind of think outside those little thin diagram thinking paradigm stuff. So. And lastly, and probably most important, Reformation Brewery, the best beer ever made. The best beer with like only two IPAs because IPAs shouldn't even be beer. So there's that. I said it. hope I didn't piss you off. But if I did, I did. Well, I'd say what, like, I guess we're kind of here, and we're trying to do these seminar things, too, where it's like, we don't want to talk about the season of fishing while it's kind of occurring. We kind of want to talk about it a little bit prior, so you can kind of get prepped for it. So, like, we'll be talking about summer fishing in the spring, vice versa, so now we're talking about winter fishing. And that's kind of one of the weird things about the South, um, is we don't really have, per se, what you would classify as winter fishing anywhere else. And that's because we don't really have like that dramatic seasonal change like a lot of these fish experience up north. Like they don't spend six they months under in, ice. Yeah, they don't go into complete dormancy. Yeah. You know, yeah. They actually yeah. start feeding really well. Um, 
the river temperatures through the winter in the south, you know, Tennessee is the southernmost habitat for muskie. Um, and it just so happens that it works out best for flies and fly fishing for muskie in the south because of the river temperatures. Somewhere in the high 40s to upper 50s seems to be the best. The fish slow down, their metabolic rates slow down a little bit. So they the flies work the best because they don't have the super fast erratic action that some of the hard baits and the gear baits have. But you know, you'll still get them throughout, you know, November to May or, or yeah, pretty much May. You take a month off there when they're trying to spawn, obviously, but you, know, you, you still get them, but it works. And the flies seem to work better in the wintertime than the gear, to me anyway. No, I think, think he's right. And that's one of the things, like, you kind of nailed it, said it without saying it. Um, like, that's the thing that the fly does really well that you'll see crossover with. Is, I mean, there's really no, like, they don't know what this shit is. They don't care. Like, they're just responding. I mean, they, don't, they really have no... They really don't give two shits about anything that any of us are doing. Yeah, there's no cognizance factor yeah. to this. Like, there's really... Like, the only way you can really break down any of these presentations whatsoever is just by the factors, um, like, of action and speed and size and stuff like that. And that's where the fly stuff actually... Um, there's not really a conventional analog to that. Like, we get close, but there's certain things that we, like, can't do that that does super well and um it'll catch some big fish so much that like we actually throw flies on carolina rigs with conventional tackle <clears throat> in the winter time quite a bit and it's amazing because when you do that like we're doing we're using that subtlety and literally these things are just so organic in the water and they're so slow in the way that they drop when they hang mm -hmm. like you watch the yeah, fish and you get it yeah, yeah and they'll just come up and they'll go oh okay and yep. they nip it so like those those elements of subtlety that fly does so well, like you can borrow and exchange that with the conventional stuff, but like that's especially wintertime, like the fly stuff really has a really has an ace in the hole.